Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here uh, on vacation, so it's kind of spontaneous, and I realized the only machine I have here is a Windows 10, so some things may not work properly, but uh, we'll try to make do. Uh, my name is Michał Wysiak. I, uh, I originally come from Poland, but now I live in Sweden. Uh, so when we are here, I come from around here, and now I live here. And uh, I work for this company. Uh, we have two offices in Sweden. We like to call ourselves knowledge-based company uh, because we we also instead we we do a consultancy, .NET consultancy, but also we, we try to help our customers with uh, sharing knowledge. We invest a lot into community. We do our own conference, Let's Speak. It's in October in Stockholm this year. Um, we also sponsor a lot of user groups, both in Sweden, but also in other parts of Europe. And uh, yeah, we're hiring. And uh, so while working there, I do mostly back and for uh, uh, web and mobile application, mostly in .NET and mostly in C Sharp. Uh, I, I play with F Sharp uh, mostly by night. Uh, when I'm not programming, I do some crazy stuff like skiing or flying or this kind of stuff. Uh, pro, that's why I'm why I'm in the wheelchair. And uh, let's go to the main topic. Who has done anything with F Sharp? Cool. There are some hands up. Who is running production F Sharp code? Okay, now I'm scared. Um, Don't be scared. Where, where do you work? In Credit Suisse. Yeah, I thought so. All right, cool. Uh, so a few words about F Sharp. Uh, it's. Uh, you see this? Oh. So it was created in 2005 and uh, by uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Uh, Don Syme is the main uh, architect be behind the F Sharp. He's also responsible, for example, for uh, generics in C Sharp. So he's one of the uh, main. Uh, research people in the language area for Microsoft. Uh, it was officially released in 2010 with uh, Visual Studio 2010. Uh, it's statically typed language, although in very uh, very often you don't see those types because you don't have to openly declare them in many, many cases. Um, because it's a very strong uh, mechanism of type inference. Uh, right now, it's nothing new for uh, for C sharp developers because we can use keywords var and it also can figure out the the type you're uh, you're going to use. But in F sharp, it's even stronger. So uh, uh, very often, when you write code, you you wouldn't need to use uh, type declaration if it's some simple code. Uh, Microsoft called the, the F sharp that it's functional first language. It's not pure functional language, so it's not like for example, Haskell, uh, they decided to um, limit its uh, pure purity to, to make it more usable. So around some uh, some places, it's uh, it has some uh, it's breaking some functional rules and it's more uh, like uh, uh, thanks to that it's more usable. Uh, but you can also write object-oriented code in uh, in F# -Sharp if you want. So. Uh, Sometimes it makes it a little bit more confusing. And uh, if you would like to start with F Sharp, I don't recommend going the, the object oriented way because it's not the way to get into the functional uh, paradigm. Uh, but if you need it for some reasons, uh, you can do it. For example, one of the popular usages of F Sharp is doing uh, domain modeling uh, for, um, for, and the rest of your code is done in C Sharp. Uh, and that's one of the good object-oriented usages. Uh, it's also f uh, open sourced, and uh, the compiler and most of the tools are, or all of the tools are open source. Right now, it's not even governed by Microsoft. There is a F# -sharp, uh, foundation that takes care of the code base, and, uh, and the last official release is 3.1, but. Uh, uh, there is upcoming version 4, which is mostly driven by community, not Microsoft. So it's um, and it's full open source project, meaning they also not, not only share the, the source code, but they also accept pull requests and they're generally very open. Also, the community is very friendly and open, and uh, 
they're very nice to newcomers, very helpful in uh, asking uh, in uh, responding to questions and uh, generally very nice people. And uh, AppShop is also a .NET language which brings some uh, good news for, that, for us because uh, you can reuse all of the code you've written before, you can reference the .NET libraries, you can reference uh, libraries written in C-Sharp or VB.NET. So um, very often you can start using F-Sharp in your organization without the full code rewrite. You can just um, write some module in F-Sharp and just reference it from C-Sharp and use some written C-Sharp code before and you can nicely incorporate it into your existing code base. And uh, Microsoft say that it's a first-class citizen in Visual Studio and the Xamarin Studio, meaning it has the same tooling support as C Sharp. People who actually work with F Sharp know it's not entirely the truth, but uh, it's catching up there and thank, mostly thank, thanks to a community effort that doing a lot of nice tools that are helpful in, uh, in doing that. And, uh, from my uh, experience, Xamarin is even faster at embracing the, the community projects and putting the, the, them into their own products. Um, a little bit about type providers. This is very, a very specific feature of F -sharp. I haven't seen it in uh, other languages. And uh, what they are is basically, um, they're like, Plugins for a for a compiler. They are compile time uh, components that inject code uh, uh, like types into compiler. So when you when you generate types by uh, using type providers, they are not done by uh, code generation like in some uh, C sharp tools, but by uh, injecting types directly into compiler in the build type uh, pipeline. So as I mentioned, there is no code generation involved. Uh, so it's a, it's a compiler plugin that has access to external world for some external data. And uh, what, when you implement type providers, you provide both a signature of the types and implementation for accessing external data and creating those types. Uh, thanks to that, mostly thank, thanks to providing signatures, you can get tools like Sign, uh, IntelliSense, so you can um, you can provide IntelliSense for the types you're generating. And because uh, type providers are uh, generated on demand, you get them generated dynamically. So for example, if you're using type providers for, uh, uh, for matching like uh, whole Wikipedia, you're not, getting, you're not loading the whole Wikipedia at, at, at one time, you're just getting, for example, categories that when you drill down to the categories, you get, for example, sports or whatever. And, and they are dynamically loaded, so uh, for many of those demos, uh, I will need working internet, and um, and that's that's upside, and this can be downside if your code code has to run uh, offline. But then you probably wouldn't like to access the external data that's somewhere on the internet. <coughs> All right, I'll have some demos. I hope they will work. Uh, we'll see about that. So, because uh, uh, you haven't done much with uh, f -sharp, I uh, try to... write code line by line and uh, get results from that. So, uh, something like this. And, um,
So basically, you can run your code uh, in a interactive mode, and um, that's very useful for exploring stuff. You don't have to write your whole code, put it in the structures, put it in programming classes and uh, modules, and then compile and hope does it work. But you can basically um, write your own or all algorithm this way by prototyping and then just put it in the structures you want. The other way to run interactive code is uh, writing stuff in the in this window. And uh, you can highlight it and run by alt enter in default uh, settings. So you can highlight a few lines of code or you can uh, uh, highlight all of the code on or run it. You have to do the whole structure like in C sharp. Basically in a in F sharp you don't really need the structure to run a uh, code. It's useful to put them in modules and you can also have classes as I mentioned, but you don't need it so for some simple stuff you can just write the script in uh, one single file and run it. And uh, keywords used in uh, F sharp, for example open is the same like using in C sharp. Let is the same as var, but with one uh, one difference. Uh, by default, uh, uh, variables are not really variables in uh, F sharp because they immutable. So I cannot add new stuff to uh, to Z because yeah, this value is is not immutable. If you want your values to, to be able to change values, you have to openly declare it. So it's going to be that. Then you probably can do it. And also, the, the keyword for uh, changing value is different than equal sign. So you'll know that you, you, you have to openly declare that I'm changing the value of this, of this variable. So, so you know that you're doing it. And, and it's not cool in functional programming. So after this short uh, introduction, uh, I'll go to my demo. So I had a story behind it. Basically, <coughs> let's assume you want to uh, create a startup. And because we want to create a startup, we also, of course, fly to San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, to fly to San Francisco, you need to buy, book tickets. And my first demo was with uh, HTML type providers that parse the Norwegian website for getting tickets. Unfortunately, they recently changed the structure of uh, results, results of the booking ticket, so I won't show you that, but uh, uh, what HTML type providers can do, then they can extract the structure things from a website. For, for example, you can structure, get lists, all the lists from website, and if they're named, then you can get them by name, so uh, I'm just going to show how this would look like, but uh, it's not going to work. My third day with OSX. Um, so you do something like uh, HTML structure list, and then you would have like uh, with IntelliSense you get list of lists that are implemented on websites. For example, it would be like flights, and then you get like HTML portion of this uh, what's inside this list element. So this way you can, uh, the same stuff you can do with tables and uh, I think also div elements from the website. So you can this way parse the, um, the structure of the website and after that the, the type provider would load the inside elements of this uh, website. That's pretty cool and this works very nice combined with the interactive mode because you can basically explore what's in the website structure. And how do you initialize that HTML uh, structure? Yeah, so uh, when you use HTML type provider, I don't remember how you exactly do it, but most of the type providers are uh, initialized by using some class name that it's used, and then there is in those uh, pointy uh, things you put a like URL on or uh, stuff to the file on disk, uh, link to the file on disk. 
So yeah, and uh, because Norwegian flights flies across the Atlantic, they use Dreamliner airplanes. I uh, and I heard not so good things about those planes, so I decided to do some research about them. And then my first step would be going to my own personal database of flights I've done before, if I ever flew this plane, to see if you know I survive once. It's probably safe. And uh, the way you you access this again doesn't really work on my Windows 10 because some uh, database drivers I couldn't figure out in the uh, last hour. So we have to trust me this works. It's configured properly. Uh, how you initialize the type provider is basically use SQL data connection and in those pointy parentheses you put a connection string you usually use like in web config in ASP.NET or uh, basically a connection string to database. And uh, on the schema you get uh, your tables. So after, after I use the schema object I can uh, drill down to my tables uh, that are there. So I, I have probably tables like airplanes, flights, and all that stuff. And then you can iterate on them because you get back a list of results. So for example, you can iterate on them and print, print the manufacturers of airplanes I flew. And then you can run normal link queries on that, which uh, also will give you uh, results interactively. It's also nice. And it's, it, if you have like properly structured uh, database with uh, foreign keys and uh, and uh, index keys, it also figures out connections between those tables. It's also very nice to to like drill down into database you, you don't know nothing about and you want to investigate connections between them and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so from my own investigation, I figure out I I didn't flew Dreamliner ever. So let's get into another level of investigation. Uh, you know this website? It's really cool because you can track airplanes going in air and uh, it's very nice. They also claim that they don't have API. And um, yes, that's true. That's well they don't have API, but uh, how can I turn on the dev tools here? Let's try it. Do you know how to turn on DevTools in Chrome? F12? Yeah, it's Mac, it does work. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Should be there, the insane orange here. Let's do it. Yes. Control Shift E. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, no. So, uh, there is something like that here. And this looks like JSON, right? <coughs> so, um, so it's it's not properly formatted JSON. So I do a lot of stuff around it to clean it up a little bit. So it's not very important part. I also have backup version if we don't have internet. But um, let's run it. So oh, yeah, now I have my uh, JSON provider. So the way you use JSON provider is that uh, you provide some example line from this JSON and this parses it and creates objects and based on that you parse the actual JSON you get from website. So after that I can iterate through list and for example get uh, The, those uh, 
sequence things I used is uh, it's basically uh, F sharp implementation of least, and this is when you do F sharp programming, it's the most often used uh, structure you will use. It's very powerful, but uh, it's basically single line list. So, what I get here is basically what's in this JSON with IntelliSense. I can uh, go to aircraft, altitude, destination, and so on. So, I can, for example, filter uh, if there are any. B787 flying currently, and we have some of them. That's cool. So let's check if there are some of them flying from Norwegian Airlines. DY is the ICAO code for uh, Norwegian Airlines. And let's print it. Let's see what we get back. So we have there is actually one Boeing 787 flying from Oslo to. Uh, so I think it's uh, Orlando Airport. So yeah, I think we're pretty safe. We can fly to uh, San Francisco, build our startup. So fast forward a few years, we got rich because everybody who writes a startup gets rich, right? And uh, we can buy our own aircraft. And uh, to do that, let's, let's investigate some uh, options on Wikipedia. Uh, what I'm gonna use for that is a Freebase, Freebase type providers. Freebase is a like open graph database that uh, accumulates a lot of knowledge, like human knowledge. It also has uh, access to many Wikipedia uh, documents. This one, unfortunately, also doesn't work here, which is sad because that that one is pretty cool. Uh, but uh, so. Basically, you can drill down to categories and uh, search for data. For, for for example, you can search for baseball teams. You can look for uh, cities, towns, population of countries. There is uh, so many categories that it, it takes minutes, for example, to uh, to download some of those subcategories. Uh, so it's at some points it's not very well optimized, but uh, it can give you a lot of data. And uh, I uh, I couldn't figure out why this doesn't work. And this this doesn't have anything to do with my uh, Windows 10. It has something to do with um, with packages I have installed. So um, yeah, we'll have to skip it. But uh, I recommend to check it out uh, at home. And uh, the last point of the of the story was to actually find an airport where I can store my aircraft. So uh, I picked some uh, business jets. I, I think we can uh, that meets some criteria like range and uh, other things. And then I know it needs around uh, I don't know, about ten thousand feet of runway, something around that seven thousand feet of runway. So I'm using another uh, source of data, which, which is basically CSV file, which is very common in uh, in scientific. Uh, usages. Scientists, scientists love their CSV files. So the way it works is very similar for uh, to a JSON type provider. Uh, I wrote some math code here to calculate distances. It's not very necessary for example. I also run files and the way you love this is similar to JSON type provider. Basically reference that files and uh, th this time we don't have to f add the uh, uh, like template called file looks but the file needs to have like first line explaining what kind of uh, data it is so then it uses other types so now I run some uh, query to find basically airports uh, that are open that are <coughs> close to a uh, Krakow because that's where I ran this demo last time, and uh, and over 7,000 feet. Oops, it's not the whole code. Uh, Lambda please. Microsoft Visual Studio window. Jump list. Exiting narrator. That was fun. <laughs> F sharp talking. 
that was actual demo. That was the, the narrator, so if you hit like, I think, Windows Enter, you get it. So yeah, I get three airports or airfields close to Krakow that fit my criteria. So, um, and uh, probably you wouldn't do it like that in like writing code, but connecting the type providers and interactive mode gives you a lot of power to uh, to explore data that you don't know much about it or you don't understand the structure of it. Uh, and there are many other type providers. I recently found very useful the WASDEL type provider because I got from client the API, the SOAP service, that wasn't documented in a way, it was just SOAP endpoint. So I started exploring it with F Sharp interactive mode and the WSDL type provider and basically drill in and uh, started getting some just understanding which if I give this data what I will get back and uh, in like one of a couple of hours I, I documented all the features from this API I, I needed to in my code run and then just rewrote it in C Sharp because that was the client's uh, uh, city but that was a nice usage for F -Sharp. I was very happy to have this tool in my tool uh, and because uh, the uh, community is very fun, they also do some crazy things. Apparently, uh, writing those type providers is not. Well, this may not work because I need to get coverage for that. But uh, that's the type of provider that does nothing but draws squirrels in the IntelliSense window. So basically when you press dot you get another drawing of squirrel. So my point is if people spend their time doing something like that, it cannot be hard to draw them, right? And uh, to write the type of provider is actually a massive amount of code, but most of them is reusable and there is uh, already like type providers development start pack that has the most of the heavy lifting included. So the, the part you're actually doing is uh, providing the types and, uh, and getting data that works with those types. It's still quite a lot of code that doesn't look very clear, but uh, it's not a rocket science to start doing it. Uh, cool. Yeah, so other type providers, oops, yeah, they're here. So for example, WordBank, which is very similar to uh, the one that I didn't show you, the uh, uh, Freebase. So it has also a large amount of data, but this is mostly financial and uh, sociological data about countries, nations, uh, economy, and uh, uh, XML, I think it's obvious, all data uh, for uh, expo exporting all data endpoints. Hadoop and R allows you to run Hadoop and R code within F Sharp, which is uh, quite interesting, especially statistics, some statisticians and uh, uh, data scientist likes to mix F -sharp with R. I, I know few people from Cambridge University who do that. Uh, WSDL, this is the one that I mentioned. TypeScript allows you to, to compile TypeScript and also use TypeScript from within F -sharp. And there are many, many more. And because there's like open way to create them, they're growing quickly, and uh, many of them are on GitHub and you can contribute to them. So if you want to learn about type providers and f -sharp in general, there is a few websites here, links, uh, I'll post them somehow through, uh, through group. Uh, Try f -sharp is a very cool interactive website by Microsoft that allows you to run f -sharp within the 
browser. It's not very fast because it runs in JavaScript, but um, it allows you to play around with f -sharp without installing anything. You just need browser and you can do some exercises for getting data, drawing graphs. Like in a matter of few hours, you can learn some basics. f -sharp columns is a it's so like a set of fa failing unit tests that uh, you need to fix to pass and uh, after like two hours of doing this you, you get some sense of basic f -sharp syntax so it's also a good way to start. f -sharp for a profit is a very good website for a more in-depth reading so if you want to understand how things work and f -sharp Software Foundation is the one I mentioned that takes care of the uh, F -sharp code base. It has also a lot of learning resources on there. I also linked the original white paper that described type providers. As a, it's not super clear, but it's also not super scientific. So you can read quite a lot how those uh, type providers work under the hood. And there are some blog posts that uh, that mention some other type providers. I also recommend following hashtag F -sharp on Twitter because uh, a lot of people from F -sharp community hang out there and add, answer questions and there's interesting discussion. And as I mentioned, they're a very open and friendly community. I uh, also recommend watching those three talks. Some of them are general F -sharp talks and uh, the one at the last is the F -sharp type provider talks. Very interesting also. And that's all from me. I'll take questions. With the CSV provider, um, it, you have to have the columns, the column names, yeah? Yeah, there should be in the first line of the file. Could you show us the, the files? files? Yeah, sure. So yeah, first line has basically the names of the columns and the rest are the values. And some of those, some of those uh, columns will miss the values. And uh, that's why I had uh, turned on option to ignore errors because if you don't have this option, this will, uh, I think, it will throw the exception and just break on the on those lines that are not full. But if you turn on ignore errors, it will just ignore those lines that contain errors.